Movement, First United Church of Christ, through our fireside service on this Transfiguration Sunday. Certainly one of the most uh, significant events in the history of, of the church, and certainly one of the most important events in the entirety of the New Testament. Let's begin with our, our call to worship. Again and again, Jesus calls. Rise up from your despair. Come out from your brooding worry. Step out from the shadow of grief. Walk toward hope. Breathe in the Spirit. Live a resurrection life. And sing a joyful song. And we certainly did that as we uh, listened to Sheila. She played uh, Our God, Our Help in Ages Past. Because it certainly is reminiscent of uh, some of those important themes that we find in the New Testament. So, let us prepare to uh, confess our sins to one another. Because when we pray, we are speaking to God. And when we pray and listen, God speaks to us. So therefore, let us enter into a dialogue with our God. We confess without reservation that our dialogue with you, O God, is, is so often not really a dialogue. So often we ask without listening, complain without offering a thanksgiving. We pray and we cannot understand why, why we get no response. Awaken us to wonder. If you called, would we answer? Or, or would you get a busy signal from us? Would you leave a message and get no answer in return? We confess anew our impatience and our unwillingness to sit in the holy stillness of your presence. Forgive us, loving God. Thank you for letting us try again. In this minute of silence, let us be still and listen to what you would say to us this day. May we, we pray in silence. Amen. The good news for us is that even when we, we try and fail again and again, God still loves us. And in the richness of God's grace, we can accept the peace of Christ, that peace which we know passes all understanding. And we can sing a joyful amen and the glory, glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, for as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Today I think two of our uh, three lessons from Scripture will be remarkably familiar to us, but they're remarkably important as well. So let's pray that our hearts and our minds might be open and that our souls might be illumined by the word that we receive in Scripture. We pray, Holy God, your word truly is a light to our paths. We pray that you would illumine our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit. In the reading and proclamation of your scripture, confront us in our sin, comfort us in our sorrow, heal our wounds, and inspire us to follow you. For the sake of Christ, we pray. Amen. In the turn of the scriptures today, we read from, from 2 Kings important part of the history of the Jewish nation, and we read from the second chapter, the first 12 verses. When the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were, were on their way from Gilgal. And Elijah said to Elisha, stay here. The Lord has sent me to Bethel. But Elisha said, as surely as the Lord lives and you live, I will not leave you. So, they went down to Bethel. The company of the prophets at Bethel came out to Elisha and asked, Do you know that the Lord is going to take your master from you today? Yes, I know, Elisha replied. So be quiet. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, Elisha. The Lord has sent me to Jericho. And he replied, As surely as the Lord lives and you live, I will not leave you. So, they went to Jericho. The company of the prophets of Jericho went up to Elisha and asked him, Do you know that the Lord is going to take your master away from you today? Yes, I know, 
So be quiet. And then Elijah said to him, Stay here, the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. And, and he replied, As surely as the Lord lives and you live, I will not leave you. So the two of them walked on, and fifty men from the company of the prophets went and stood at a distance, facing the place where Elijah and Elisha stopped at the Jordan. And Elijah took off his cloak and rolled it up and struck the water with it. And the water was divided to the right and to the left. And the two of them crossed over on dry ground. And when they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me, what can I do for you before I am taken from you? Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit, Elisha replied. You have asked a difficult thing, Elisha said. Yet, if you, see me, if you see me when I am taken from you, it will be yours. Otherwise, it will not. And as they were walking along and talking together, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. Elisha saw this and, and cried out, My father, my father, the chariots and the horsemen of Israel. And Elisha saw him no more. And then he took hold of his garment and tore it in two. If you're interested, the rest of this uh, particular lesson from Scripture is fascinating, and I would encourage you to, uh, to take some time and, and read it yourself. But then we come to Paul, and we read from his letter to the second, the second letter to the Corinthians from the fourth chapter. And Paul writes, Even if our gospel, gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of the unbelievers so that cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of the Lord, who is the image of God. For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the kingdom of God's glory that was displayed in the face of Christ. And then we read this remarkable narrative from Mark, the ninth chapter. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up a high mountain, where they were all alone, and there he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say. They were, they were all so frightened. And then a cloud appeared and, and covered them, and a voice came from the cloud, This is my son, whom I love. Listen to him. And suddenly when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. And as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until, until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. One other translation um, for this particular passage uh, has the voice from the cloud saying, This is my Son in whom I delight. Listen to him. Surely the words of a, a loving, a loving father. Patching up loss, loss and disappointment, uh, can really make life not simply bearable, it can make life uh, beautiful. When Rhoda Carchenau was growing up in Canada, her family really didn't have very much money, and her mother was, was an excellent seamstress. So she made and mended all of her his clothes. In fact, I can remember my mom making up almost all of my clothes till I was perhaps in, in third or fourth grade, and she made virtually all of her clothes. Uh, she was remarkable. Well, similar to around his mother. Her mother was so skilled with the needle and thread that, that no one could even see her repairs. And, Arana says, I, I can remember when she would mend my clothes, she would make the stitches so, so, so terribly small they were, they were invisible. 
and she did this because there was a sense of shame associated with wearing wearing mended clothes. And she goes on to say, the kids would tease you because they'd be like, uh, you know, can't you afford a new pair of jeans? Well, let's move fast forward to 2024. And today, Arona is a Canadian still, and uh, she's one of the, they would call a Canadian fiber artist. And NPR reports that, that she mends her own clothes. But she doesn't do it in a manner that her mother did. No, she does exactly the opposite. Instead of trying to hide the repairs, she practices a, a style which is actually becoming quite popular, known, known, known as a visible mending. She said, you know, with this approach, you, you, you use noticeable threads and fabrics and decorative, decorative techniques to, to show off your mend. And you know, quite frankly, if you follow NPR, this has become re remarkably hot. In, in recent years, there have been uh, quite a few uh, how-to mending books that have been put out on the shelves. And, one was written by Rauda. Uh, if you go on social media, you can find mending ideas that, that focused, on, on, focused on artistry and, and self-expression. Now, that kind of mending is, is a source of pride and not a source of shame. And of course, well, you might say it has an ethical component too. When you Visible mending is, is a good approach to take when you think of the ton, thousands of tons of clothes that are disposed of in, in landfills every day. You know, not to mention the carbon emissions that, that do come when uh, all new clothes are manufactured. So one might say you're even making a, an environmental uh, contribution. The fact is, uh, visible mending is, is beautiful. It's a healthy activity. And I think it's a, it's a, it's a beautiful and healthy activity in, in, in clothing as well as in human beings. And so here we find ourselves in, in, in Second Kings. Uh, First Kings, by the way, gives us a, a marvelous narrative that, that brings us up to speed, but here we are in Second Kings, and uh, Elijah's already made a remarkable <coughs> name for himself. And uh, what we find out now is that the prophet Elisha is being torn apart by the departure of his mentor Elijah. And the story goes the two men were on the road to Gilgal, outside Gilgal. They were down near the Jordan River, and Elijah knows that his prophetic work is, is coming to an end, and so he really tries to separate himself from, from Elisha. He says to Elisha, his younger colleague, uh, stay here for the Lord has sent me on to Bethel. But Elisha says, I will not leave you. And so as you know, they continue down the road to Bethel where they run to a company of prophets, some, some 50 prophets. And once again, Elisha tries to separate himself uh, and he fails. So the two walk on a little bit further on to Jericho and for the third time, uh, Elijah tries unsuccessfully to, to leave Elisha behind. And, and then the two men, continuing to be followed by this company of prophets, proceed to the Jordan River. We know a lot of history about the Jordan River, don't we? So Elijah takes his mantle, which is a cloak made of cloth. He rolls it up and he strikes the water. And the water is parted. One rolls up and to the right and one rolls up to the left. Sure reminds us of another passage uh, from the Red Sea uh, when, when Moses and the Israelites uh, crossed the Red Sea. It also is a remembrance of, uh, of the, the journey of, of the Israelites uh, through the Jordan River uh, as they were led by Joshua into the Promised Land. In the history of Israel, the kind of tearing that uh, happens here is a good thing. Tearing the water apart, opening the water so that people can't pass through is a, is a good thing. And once they get to the other side, uh, Elijah says to Elijah, tell me what I may do for you before I'm taken away from you. Exactly what a, what a good mentor would say. And Elisha says this, please let me inherit a double share of your spirit. Now, isn't that a beautiful sentiment? What a beautiful request. He's not asking to inherit Elijah's money or his property. He's requesting a double share of, of the older prophet's spirit. He wants to be seen as Elijah's heir. He wants to continue to do Elijah's powerful work in the world. He wants to be like Arona, continue her mother's work as, as a seamstress, as a, as a, as a mender. And Elijah... It's perfectly honest. He says, well, that's going to be a really tough request to, to fulfill. But if you see me as I'm taken from you, it will be granted to you. 
In effect, he's saying that the Lord will make it happen if it's God's wish. The Lord will make it happen if Elijah, if Elisha sees his mentor's departure. And lo and behold, that's exactly what happens. What a marvelous image that is of a chariot of fire and a horse of fire, and they separate the two, and Elijah sends into heaven in a whirlwind. You know, this is the event that, that sets him up for a thousand years later to meet with Jesus and, and several of the disciples of, in the Transfiguration. He meets Jesus uh, along with the other great lawgiver, Moses. So Elijah walks, watches the ascent of Elijah and, until he passes out of sight. Then the record tells us that Elisha grasps his own clothes and tears them into pieces. In the Old Testament world, that was a sign of mourning and grief and loss. He's, he's torn apart, as, as we all would be, with, with the loss of our mentor, the departure of our mentor. You know, he's unsure of what kind of mending a, a future holds for him. And I think all of us, at one time or another, feel exactly what Elisha felt. Each of us has come to a crossroads like that. It happens. It happens when we leave home for the first time. It happened to me as I remember heading off to college as a kid. It happens when we start a new job or we move to a new city or we finally suddenly find ourselves out of work. It happens when we get married or when we get divorced or, or we lose a spouse or just as we're beginning to enjoy retirement. It, it happens when we visit the doctor hoping for, for some good news only to receive a, a life-altering diagnosis. We all come to crossroads. We all involve loss. And all that can really lead to a, to a tearing of, of clothes, of mourning, of passion. A young woman, about 35 years of age, her name was Kate Bowler. She had a husband and a child, and she had a pretty prominent position at Duke University uh, Divinity School. She discovered at 35 that she had stage 4 cancer. And that was, a, without question, it was a crossroads for her, it involved the loss of something that she thought was a life of infinite choices and, and unlimited progress. And from her hospital bed, she wrote this. I see no master plan to bring me to a higher level, to guarantee my growth, to use my cancer to teach me. Nothing will exempt me from the pain of being human. Yeah, we know that, don't we? We know that from experience. We know that suffering is a part of human life. You know, to, to, to try to say that pain doesn't exist is to deny, to deny that Jesus still had the nail marks in his hand even after the resurrection. To downplay the, the struggles is, is to pretend that, that Jesus never left, left, left that lofty mountain of the transfiguration and never left Moses and, and Elijah behind. And the fact is that, that Jesus came down that mountain and, and said this. He was going to go through many sufferings and be treated with contempt from that mountaintop experience brings us to mind the, the words of Martin Luther King, I've been to the mountain. You go from that mountaintop experience and Jesus says then, I'm going to go through many sufferings and be treated with contempt and the very first thing that happens to him when he comes down into the valley, he's called to, to, to derive an evil spirit from, from a boy. You know, the work of, of, of visible mending is done in, in a series of stitches. So, you know, first, we, we allow ourselves to, to enter into the pain of others. I remember this event uh, was several decades ago, just 10 days after uh, his 24-year-old son was, was killed in an automobile accident. Uh, the, the Reverend William Sloan Coffin uh, delivered a sermon to his congregation at, at Riverside Church in, in New York. and He thanked them for the flood of letters that had followed his son's death, including one that carried this marvelous quote from, from Hemingway. It said, the world breaks everyone, then some become strong at the broken places. Coffin said, my own broken heart is mending, and largely thanks to so many of you, my dear parishioners, for in the last week I, I've relearned one lesson. It is that love not only begets love, it also transmits strength. I think the second stitch of visible mending is the offering of love that transmits through strength. Coffin discovered from himself in that terrible tragedy it really broke him that the Christian community stepped in to fill him with love and strength. He says with no doubt whatsoever they became a better pastor 
after, after having had that experience of, of repair. You know, some of us realize that the strongest and most beautiful people are those around us who, who aren't ashamed to share their mending. You know, the parents of, a, of an autistic child who give valuable experience to uh, others in the same situation. The AA or GA sponsor who, who patiently helps a, a fellow addiction remain sober or free from gambling. The survivor of abuse who offers a lifeline to those who are being abused. The wife of an Alzheimer's patient who offers support to families dealing with various types of dementia. A cancer survivor who is more than ready to, to sit and counsel someone who gets a, a new diagnosis of cancer. Now, the reality is that, that nobody, no one of us is ever going to escape the pain of, of being human. In every life there are going to be some rips and tears and some of them will be small and some of them will be pretty darn big. And the good news we find from Scripture and from our friends is that God is with us, helping us to do that, that visible mending. In 2 Kings, Elisha picks up the mantle of Elisha, returns to the bank of the Jordan River. And what does he do? He strikes the water with the mantle, and the waters part again. And when he crosses the river, the company of prophets say this, The spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. I think the third stitch of, of, of visible mending is the continuation of, of, of the faithful work of people who have come before us. When we pick up the mantle of a mentor, we don't make them invisible. Instead, we carry their spirit forward. When we pick up a mission in, in First United Church of Christ in Easton, we just don't pick up one thing. We pick up the history that's come to us for more than 250 years. We carry their spirit forward. For Elisha, the, the mantle of Elijah becomes the symbol of of God's visible mending. In the end of her book, uh, No Cure for Being Human, uh, Kate Bowler, she thanks her heroes, the family members, the, the friends who supported her and prayed for, for her throughout her cancer treatments. She said that, that the ability to work throughout this illness made my life not simply bearable, it made my life beautiful. When we allow God to work through us as he worked through Elisha. We're, we're part of God's visible bending. When we enter in, into the pain of others, showing love that transmits strength, we become the kind of heroes uh, that help William Sloan Coffin and, and Kate Bowler. We remain faithful and prayerful in, in the face of losses and disappointments. We patch together a life that's not simply bearable. We patch together a life that is certainly beautiful. And that is the work of a visible mending. Amen. Let's affirm our faith together. We belong to God, the eternal and infinite creator of all things and all that is to come. We follow Christ, who comes to us from God and reveals God to us. He heals people and transforms lives and calls us to join in his ministry. He was crucified, died, and was raised again by God and reigns over all creation. And he bids us to die and rise with him in the service of the healing <coughs> of the world. We are moved by the Holy Spirit together with the communion of saints as members of the body of Christ, God's holy and universal church. We are confident in the forgiveness of sin, the power of the resurrection, and the reality of eternal life, and in all things it is our desire to follow Christ by the grace of the Holy Spirit, for God's glory. Amen. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Lord God, we give you thanks for all your gifts to us, for daily food, for health, for each breath we take, for freedom to choose, and the gifts of your word, your power, and your love. Our hearts are truly overwhelmed, O God, when we consider how you've entrusted so much to us, May we be worthy of that trust. May we be a people who are unafraid to live as fully and as richly as you want us to live. Help us, O oh God, as followers of Jesus, to multiply all that you have given us, to risk spreading your word and perhaps seeing it misunderstood, to gamble by loving those whose, whom others think unworthy, think worthy only of hate, to take chances by doing good to those who have not done good to us. Help us to be faith-filled and desire to increase your glory 
and your goodness in this world. Make us people who share in both word and deed that which you have given us to share. We pray for the church gathered today, both here and around the world, that it may encourage all of its members to discover, develop, and use all their gifts, those of nature and those of grace. We pray for those who are poor in body or in spirit, for those oppressed and heavy laden, for those sick or in despair, especially those on our prayer list. Minister by your spirit and by us to all those whom we have prayed, and help us to walk faithfully in the path of our Lord Jesus Christ. May we pray as our Lord and Father, Lord Jesus Christ, taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. May we prepare ourselves for the benediction and our final hymn of worship. When the reign of God finally and fully comes, there will be no disease, no violence, no despair, no want, no sorrow. But, <coughs> excuse me. Until that day arrives, we are to be bearers of God's kingdom, offering healing and hope, a compassionate shoulder, a willingness to listen, a hand to hold. This is our calling our vocation of Christ's disciples, but we do not do it alone. God is our strength, Christ is our life, the Spirit is our power. Go to live and love in the name of the triune God. Amen. <laughs>